Hello, a warm welcome to the Respectful Net Theatre channel. Today is the 13th of December 2021. In our today's episode, we will speak about digital liveness, which is an essential topic for theatre and performance in digital cultures. We will discuss the upcoming question with two guests, uh, three guests, <laughs> who are experts for our topic from different areas of research and the arts, bringing together their perspectives. I will present them just shortly, coming up with more detailed information later. We welcome Esther Hammelburg. She's a researcher and lecturer at the University of Amsterdam using an ethnographic approach for studying how liveness is established in people's practices of media use at contemporary cultural events. David Kaspovic, he is a scholar in media studies and philosophy at Rheinisch Westfälische Technische Hochschule, RWTH Aachen with a focus on human-robot interaction, as well as on virtuality and immersion. Michael Streubig, a Berlin-based system theorist, artist, and play designer, focusing on AI, digital liveness with critical humor. The moderation will be done by Ilya Mirsky. He is a dramaturg, more programmer, immersive media artist. He works at the Institut für Theatrale Zukunftsforschung, im Zimmertheater Tübingen, so an institute for theatrical research for better futures or futures. And he is lecturer at the University of Tübingen. He's also writing a PhD on creative artificial intelligence on stage. And myself, a scholar in theater and media studies and a performer. Before coming more closely to our topic, just let me introduce our project the Respectful Net Theatre Channel. The three lens project by Judith Ackermann, Anusha Gusalka, Kai Tuchmann and myself attempts to understand the role of theatre and performance during the conversion of human history into the supposedly post-human condition of digital cultures. We do this in conver conversations with artists from theatre performance and scholars from the humanities or technical sciences. On the other side, we also explore very practically the performative possibilities and regimes of digital environments. This becomes concrete on our digital stage on TikTok and our performative projects on Instagram. Let's come back to our topic for today. Liveness itself stands for an understanding of, a fu of the fundamental condition of our existence in sociality. It is about being together with a fully open and vivid awareness of ourselves within an environment. What comes into mind first in the context of digital liveness are performances in virtual realities via infrastructures as the internet. They are very familiar to us in this moment as a lot of people performed them and had been performed by them in their daily Zooms during the pandemic. But it is important to mention that this topic also counts beyond pandemic times and it existed long before the situation as in so-called telecommunicative performances since the 1970s. A fulminant and overwhelming starting point for these performances has been the project Hole in Space by Kit Galloway and Sherry Rubinowitz in 1980 connecting people in LA and New York via satellite and full body video projections. The topic's challenge is that as soon as we are performing in so-called virtual spaces, we are confronted with methods, strategies and aesthetics of, it, of the digital being together. This comes up with completely different conditions of and options for speciality, the body and corporal experiences, the social as well as for social reliability, then analog spaces and life presence. But these differences are not a problem. On the contrary, they are just quite new and different. Therefore, our all, overall thesis is that digital liveness is not about the loss of the latter, but about another and co-equal lifeless to the analog one. So we don't want to fall into the trap of playing off analog versus digital lifeness. On the contrary, we suppose that lifeness takes different forms and aesthetics depending the media we are dealing with and we are in. 
This implies that there had never been an analog, that is to say an unmediated pre life presence constituted by, for, um, but or to put it differently, analog life presence is just one specific mediated form of lifeless constituted, for example, by the dispositives of theater and performance providing, as it had been called, life presence. It brings people together with, with their bodies at the same time in the same space. This lifeness is not for granted, but built of techniques of being present at specific uh, places on the stage or bodily behavior. For our discussion, we see two areas and conditions for digital lifeness. Firstly, it is about the presence of and in virtual spaces spaces which had been feared in the 1990s as challenging well-defined boundaries be between so-called reality and virtuality. In today's digital cultures, virtual reality is reality and works on an own digital liveness as the modes of distant socializing during pandemic lockdowns showed so clearly. Zoom taught us, for example, to be very attentive in digital communication and liveness, and at the same time, one felt the regime and pressure of Zoom fatigue, for example, due to the technological resolution of the digital presence. Theater and performances unfolded these conditions and shape of digital liveness excessively and exemplarily by Zooming, by performing via Zoom, in social media, or in VR chat rooms using avatars. In this situation, a double corporality and transgressive, space, transgressive spaces came up. So digital liveness is not about the loss of the body and materiality, but about their transformation into transgressive bodies with multiple identities, as having, for example, an analog body and the avatar, or auto-simulation that is stimulating oneself for simulating what is missing in the virtual encounters. Moreover, within digital liveness, technical glitches and technological forms of participation made its truth trustworthy. They became its testimony and credibility of liveness as being present in one event at the same time, whereas a being in the same analog space became obsolete in this position, in this situation. So the virtual spaces of chats on YouTube or in Mozilla hubs became shared techno spaces of digital liveness. Secondly, beyond the communication and interaction in virtual realities, we asked for the liveness of human machine cooperations as one important condition of digital cultures, as for example, human and robots working together, or humans meet artificial intelligence as bots in the internet or in apps. Suddenly, humans have to generate liveness, the feeling of being together with non-humans. In contrast to the reality of virtual reality as an extra space, slightly separated from the analog world, the liveness of techno-human cooperation is one of augmented realities. That is to say, it is constituted by layering infrastructures, devices, and realities as we know it in today's digital cultures of our ubiquitous computing. We are already always in and online. The notions of the understanding of analog human presences don't fit anymore to describe this cooperation and situation as technological conditions come in, which could be named perhaps a posthuman digital lifeless. Within this posthuman background, the kind of sociality coming up with techno human cooperation as well as with digital lifeless in virtual realities is to be researched. Till now, it had been said that humans become human only in relation to human oriented life presence, which was executed especially and exemplarily in theater and cultural performances. What happens if virtual lifeness or techno human, namely, namely trans species interactions, constitute sociality? It is in question how human self understanding and subjectivation are affected if they emerge beyond anthropocentric and anthropomorphic conditions. So our focus is not just on the phenomena of digital liveness, but on the question, what are we working on with it? To discuss these aspects and questions, we bring together our guests. Esther Hammelburg is an expert in life experiences in hybrid events. A central and important thesis in her work is 
that we will inform that will inform our discussion is that liveness is a concept that continuously evolves as new media technology technologies emerge. For today's cultural digital cultures, she comes up with the telling idea that the feeling of being really there in live events comes up only by the help of help of, me, of media, as for example smartphones or via platforms as social media in which, for example, photos of the live event are posted. Esther had been a PhD candidate at the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. She just defended her PhD thesis with the title, Being There Life, How Liveness is Realized Through Media Use at Contemporary Cultural Events. Congratulations. So it is, uh, she's, she's also a lecturer at Faculty of Digital Media and Creative Industry at Amsterdam University of Applied Science. Esther's research and teaching areas include liveness, media and citizenship, media representations, media art and philosophy, media literacy and visual culture. <clears throat> David Kasprovich, Kasprovich could help us to understand the reality of virtual reality based on his research on the techno epistemological mm -hmm. constitution of virtuality in digital cultures, as he did in a handbook on this, on this topic together with Stefan Riga. On the other hand, his, his research on robot machine interaction could inform us about the digital liveness of techno human cooperation. David studied, studied media studies and philosophy. He was a PhD student at the Institute for Advanced Studies on Media Cultures and Computer Simulation called MEX at Leuphana University Lüneburg. He has been a postdoc at the Share of Theory of Science and Technology at the RGTH Aachen, which is held by Gabriele Brammelsberger, where she was also the head of the Computer Science Studies Lab. In this moment, he's a research assistant of the innovative and important Kete Hamburger colleague, Cultures of Research, an international center for advanced studies in philosophy, sociolo sociology, and history of science and technology as RWTH, where he coordinates the fellow program. Since autumn 2021, he's a DAAD scholar at the University Rouen Normandie Department of Philosophy. His main research fields include theory <clears throat> and history of embodiment, immersion and virtual reality, human robot interaction, <clears throat> philosophy of computer simulation, as well as <clears throat> phenomenolo phenomenology and computer science. Michael Streubig is a Berlin-based system theorist, artist and play designer. His artistic approach of creating playful AI and imperfect VR, <laughs> especially interesting for the discussion of digital lightness, as it is looking for reflection on its potentials and regimes by playing around with it. Michael, Michael studied computation in German informatic at University of Erlangen Nuremberg. He holds a practice-based PhD from the School of Art, Design and Architecture at the University of Plymouth. He has been an associate lecturer at your Leuphana University Lüneburg, lecturer in game arts and design at University of Plymouth and a lecturer at Nanjing University of the Arts in China. We will now start with short <coughs> inputs of our guests of about five minutes and then follow with the discussion of our topic. And I would like to ask Esther as uh, under the topic of ladies first, <laughs> to start with your input. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Martina and Ilya for the invitation to participate in this discussion. Um, as you said, on December 3rd, I received my PhD for research on how live is experienced in uh, mediatized events, particularly festivals in my research. Um, and um, I would, would like to tell you a bit about what I did um, and a bit of my insights about that. And I'd like to start off with my main claim uh, coming from this re research, namely, I think there's no live without media anymore. So all of our live experiences are shaped by the media that we use. Or as we would say in media studies, my uh, academic background, that 
in this deeply mediatized world, life is always liveness. And then the term liveness implies that media play a formative role in the live experience. I thus claim that we should, should move past the notion that there is a pure or real event as such that is then mediated. Media shape these live events and our experiences thereof. So I've performed my research in three very different uh, annual events in the Netherlands. Uh, 3FM Serious Request, uh, the, the lighted glass house that you see here, uh, is a national fundraiser that is uh, both a physical event and broadcast live on radio, television, and live stream for 24 hours a day. Um, Pride Amsterdam, uh, you see the person with the big wig, is a full week of Pride-related events in Amsterdam, with the main event, a boat parade through the canals. And Ural Festival, the, the beach, beach picture that you see there, is a landscape arts festival that programs installations, theater, and music on the Dutch island of Terschelling. Um, I hear you are interested in theater, so for those who haven't been there, this is a recommendation also, because it's an amazing festival. And um, these events all lasted seven to 10 days, which gave me the opportunity to immerse myself um, in these events and do thorough participatory research there. So I've worked with a combination of ethnographic and digital methods. I have interviewed 379 people at these three events, uh, some as the, on the ground, as you can see in these, uh, these images, but also some people who followed the events at a distance or people who had held media diaries during the events. Um, and I interviewed them afterwards. Also, I have done observations both on festival grounds um, and um, online, so particularly on Facebook and Instagram. And this follows my perspective on these events that they do not merely take place physically in, in the physical event environment, but also in various media spaces. So I've just studied the events as event spheres, uh, the full range of activities, both physical, on the ground, and in media environments. To supplement my ethnographic work, I have uh, used digital methods to collect and analyze more than 50,000 ima 15, uh, images from Instagram and Twitter. For instance, looking at visual similarity, as you see in this image, or uh, looking at the content of these images. Here you see my visual network from my Instagram data set for the Ural Festival. Uh, which contains over 5,000 images. So all the little dots in this image are uh, Instagram images. And you can see these are uh, automatically uh, arranged to see what topics come about or which content is prominent. Um, for Ural, which is on, uh, takes place on an island, for instance, boats are very uh, common, which is not a typical festival image, but the selfie there, uh, as opposed to the selfie that is, of course, uh, prominent in every event that I've studied. So but based on this research, I claim that media play a formative role in all of our live experiences. And this claim follows from three main insights from my research. The first is that, that and this uh, is close to what Martina was explaining also in, in your nice uh, introduction. Um, Life is, is the feeling of being now here together. So there's an aspect of time, an aspect of place, and an aspect of the social in the live experience. And what I've seen in my research is that media, the media that we use, thoroughly shape how we experience now, how we experience here, being here, and how we experience being together. So um, the way that we make time, place, and social context is thoroughly shaped by the media that we use in these events. And thirdly, live events take place in sort of hybrid spaces. All of our spaces have become hybrid. Uh, the COVID situation has made us, at least in the Netherlands, the discussion is on about hybrid events. I don't know which term is popular in, uh, in Germany or other countries, but these, I think these, our spaces have been hybrid for quite a while already, also before COVID. Um, we are always 
um, at the same time, we're in a physical place and in several media environments. So this influences how we experience events. And based on these three insights, I would say thus no live without media or fitting the topic of today, digital liveness is a fact. And, and I would love to discuss a bit further how media then shape these three aspects of time, place, and the social. Um, but as I was asked I want, uh, to keep this within about five minutes, I'll uh, wrap up by saying thank you very much for inviting me and I look forward to the discussion we will have. Okay, thanks a lot, Esther, um, for, 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 for your input. Um, right, and then it would be so interesting to go deeper how then it is constituted in our discussion. Thanks a lot. And I would like um, Michael, like being a, a scholar and an artist, to come as a second input. Because I'm a scholar and an artist? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks uh, very much for the invitation. Um, I have um, also five minutes to, um, yeah, stake my position a little bit. And coming from a, a systems theoretic and pra systems practical background, uh, what I like to do is instead of um, asking what is digital liveness, um, I'm looking at it through the lens of distinctions, um, a methodology I developed um, for my PhD and um, that has a background in, in systems theory and um, cybernetics. And so the first distinction that comes to mind is the uh, distinction between digital liveness and analog liveness, which uh, is something we have been discussing um, yeah, here, especially since the pandemic for, for a long time, but also in, in, in the context of theater. Um, and it always comes with a sort of um, uh, yeah, nostalgia uh, by, by certain people who uh, miss the old good analog days. I think uh, Esther has, has pointed out uh, rightly that we all um, are mediated uh, creatures uh, by now and everything beyond the immediate physical surroundings is, is coming through media. Um, but in Germany, especially the um, Germany is kind of like a, a holdout of the um, of the nostalgics, I would say that uh, a German sociologist, uh, Hartmut Rosa, quite a prominent one, just complained again uh, against about the digital and uh, he feels overwhelmed and uh, he feels that there's uh, such a big loss and we, we had records in the past and it was all, all much better. Um, so to these people, um, th th that's a little bit of a problem in general, uh, that we have these discussions all the time. And I don't think this uh, distinction is the interesting one. The interesting distinction for me is another one, and that is the question um, of uh, digital liveness versus digital non-liveness. That means um, when, when do I perceive uh, or experience a life situation mediated through the digital as opposed to watching a stream or uh, looking at something that is non-interactive? Um, again, uh, an anecdote from the German Biennale in Berlin, one of the first Biennales, I think, um, the curator at that time was rejecting interactive art because she said um, she didn't want to have people in front of screens um, uh, all the time. What happened is we were standing in front of screens all the time because the, the whole thing was full of video art, of course, which, was, which uh, has been since the beginning kind of the nemesis of, of computer art and video art had a better um, standing um, as, um, yeah, um, Grant Taylor describes in his, his wonderful book, The Troubled History of Computer Art. So the question becomes then, what, uh, how can we create digital liveness? So it's a, it's a sort of practical um, um, approach, which has a strong foot in game design and game development. Um, for example, Stephen Swink um, in a book that it has a great background. So I don't know if it works with the, with the virtual background. <laughs> yeah, it works terribly bad. Um, Game Feel, a book uh, about 
um, yeah, the practice of creating uh, a life moments through uh, the feeling of control, which is a, which is a central a central feeling uh, when you interact with an avatar in a, in a virtual space. Uh, then it's very crucial and very precise. Uh, there are precise problems around having control of this avatar and feeling the control or feeling non-control about the avatar. So liveness can be created and destroyed in these in these little things. Um, but there are other uh, a lot of other aspects that I, I would like to discuss a, a bit later uh, in this in this context. Um, the one thing that I um, yeah, one thing that I also want to mention, I think in, in response to Martina, uh, she rightly pointed out that there have been experiments in the 80s already. Um, two, two examples um, that I have in mind is a Blast series work that they, they created this uh, virtual slash physical hybrid spaces um, with a project called Can You See Me Now in 2003. And I'd hide you a bit later where they were live streaming performers who were running through the city. And I was sitting here in, in Germany and uh, um, like being live with them in some pubs in, in, in UK. Uh, and another project from 2011 uh, that was Invisible Playground, this Raum Labor, Gesine Dankwart, She Ike, a very early streaming, uh, Kind of live streaming event of a bar where people had cameras on their foreheads and um, we had a few very nice evenings in in, in that live yeah digital medi digitally mediated chaotic um everything that that uh, theater has uh, like the, the qualities of theater was in in that project so um yeah i'm 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 happy to discuss further and um thanks for now Okay, thanks a lot, Michael, for um, for these first ideas on uh, um, what how do we do digital liveness control. <laughs> okay, um, then I would ask David to give his input. Yes, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. Happy to be here with you, and I would also like to take up. Um, something that Martina already mentioned, uh, more or less, is the con co uh, concept of liveness. And uh, my simple statement is, liveness is embodied, point. Um, and um, what we um, experience today is uh, multi uh, mu multiple new ways how bodies are affected through digital technologies. That might not be so surprising, since we all, <laughs> there are a lot of discussions about that already in the 1990s, and I think some of the people here are mo much more familiar with this than me. But I would say that this new experience we have with digital technologies today changes the concept of virtuality. And this is the point I would like to emphasize. Um, why? Um, because virtuality is not anymore the kind of new and spectacular experience that have been made um, in art experiences, uh, in art expositions, in uh, the interactions with virtual reality we all have witnessed in the 1990s and we are well familiar with, also in a kind of nostalgia way already. But what we do right now is a kind of normalization and although the, 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 the concept of normal or normalization sounds a bit boring, or even biopolitic, but I do not mean this in this context, I just mean it as standardization. And standardizations always imply problems because you have to make something, something uh, explicit with what have been always a pretty standardized routine way of living, like taking part in discussions in Zoom and how to behave with your hands and your head and how to act with technologies and uh, while moving your body or how to behave with your body in interacting with these technologies. So the point I would like to make is that we have to, the, 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 in, the interesting thing is that we witness these kind of multiple ways, how we are affected or how our bodies are affected, which on the one, one, on the one hand has a long literature, but right now we are, we are really um, faced with the challenge to describe it in our, as we call it uh, in, in the philosophy, our life worlds. So the kind of world that every day what we are embedded in. It's not a special world, 
um, that we enter as soon as we enter an art exposition or things like that. So basically there's, there's a, a certain way of um, um, observing this kind of um, standardization. And right now we, I would say that, especially in media studies, we observe a lot of methods how to be able to describe these points of, of standardization and these experiences of being um, um, embodied um, in this context of digital technologies and how to live this liveness um, um, in this, uh, with these new media environments, to put it like this. One short um, remark I just would like to uh, make because why, I, why uh, my emphasis uh, on, on the concept of virtuality. Um, the simple fact is that virtuality, the concept of virtuality has a, a complete different history than the concept of uh, digital um, technologies or digital media. And this goes back to a long um, tradition um, in the philosophy a lot of people might be already familiar with, but I'd like to uh, emphasize this nevertheless, which is um, the point that in a certain time already in Aristotle, the, the, the possible or the space of possibilities has been always bound to the reality, to that what is real, what is the nature, what is physics, right? But since at least since the, uh, since the 15th, 16th century, since that what we call in German Neuzeit, so the new, the, the, the new turn after the Renaissance, this space of possibilities um, has changed. It's not, it's not bound anymore to nature. It's bound to the possibility that is able to, to, uh, to, uh, to being thought, basically. So it's, it's not anymore this kind of potentiality or virtuality is not, is, is not related to what is there already, but to what can be. And this point of what can be, and there I would also agree with Esther, um, is very much related to the uh, kind of uh, media that is used to create this possible space of uh, fictitious, of virtual worlds. And you can see this increasement of this, for example, in the 18th and 19th century with the, um, with the um, mass distribution of novels, of novel, of novel worlds, of fictitious worlds, and the alphabetization of people. So you have a, multiple, you have a pluralization of possible worlds, and from that on, um, the ways how people are embodied or affected, but by non-real words, by words of uh, novels, um, 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 changes and multiplies. And you, all, you have already these funny side effects like we witness them today, that you have new kind of sim symptoms, new psychic uh, uh, denormalizations, illnesses, symptoms, but also positive things like enthusiasm and things like that. So all these um, multiple phenomena of being affected by um, alternative non-real worlds um, can be very well um, and described, I would say, with the uh, concept of virtuality that has its own history um, here. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot, David, um, for this uh, specific and important view on virtuality, which may change, uh, which may guide the, the, our discussion, uh, because it's not uh, not just being in a, in a technological um, space, but um, uh, to 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 have to deal with. Um, um, what could be with, in, a, in a kind of imagination and speculation, which is a, a new dimension for me. So now um, we, we, we start our discussion and um, now it was me who <clears throat> speak, spoke and spoke and spoke and <clears throat> now we have also Ilya to, uh, to bring in questions and to, to guide a, a bit the discussion if it's necessary, I'm sure. <laughs> Yes, so uh, thank you, Martina. Thanks also for the nice introduction. And thanks for your input. And I see there are many interesting like concepts and many interesting interceptions about like virtuality as one topic. Uh, um, Michael, your like distinction between digital liveness and analog liveness and Esther, you with your claim that there is no life without media. And um, I think that there are like, I really appreciated your like, uh, your patterns on your slide, Esther. And I want to ask maybe as first opener, um, 
uh, when we like talk about liveness today and also Esther, you mentioned like the, all the uh, events uh, and uh, the events like you um, uh, analyzed in your PhD. Um, there's always like this mediated aspect, mediated layer of events like, like Instagram stories uh, or TikTok uh, videos. Nowadays, it's always also about like live, uh, yeah, kind of live uh, distributions, live uh, broadcasting by Instagram, by uh, TikTok. And this is kind of an, another layer. And the question uh, which I want to pose in, uh, to the discussion, um, what, what is really about this media or what is really, what does this live broadcasting aspect, which is like integrated with just one click in TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, what is it telling us about the importance of liveness for like mediatizing the events uh, or is it telling anything or is it just like a nice marketing gag? Because I mean, nowadays going live is so easy compared like to 30 years ago. So uh, feel free, yes. Yes, uh, it's an interesting question. Thank you. I think that um, these new platforms that we use change this because a lot of our events, if you look at research into media events, uh, seminal research by Diane and Katz, for instance, on media events, poses already the role, for instance, of television, live television broadcasting, informing the event, right? So a lot of the main events that we witnessed through, through television were staged also for a large part for television, for the television cameras. And these television, these shape, the, the, yeah, the way that television is organized, uh, has organized a lot of our large events in the past. Uh, the difference, of course, is that when I go to an event now on the ground, uh, so it's not only so that I can witness it from a distance by looking at it through live television, it's also so that when I am a witness on the ground, I can share my witnessing through these platforms um, and include other witnesses to my witnessing. So there's a sort of a layer um, introduced there, I think. So some of the the um, workings of this liveness is not that new, I think. It is a continuation of what we have done for a long time already, um, with the difference that it is more integrated. It has become more integrated in what we do physically as visitors to these live events, I think. Um, and of course, the, the, how these platforms are shaped this also shapes how we, yeah, how we shape our life experiences. So how sociality, for instance, in that life experience is shaped. So by, by the question, like how the platforms are shaped, you mean like if I do like an Instagram live and I'm in a, it's a nice event, mm -hmm. it's like kind of being live uh, from my point of view. So there's kind of another, another like, yeah, uh, space or, or which is, closer than in the past when you had like all those big broadcasting uh, uh, people companies there doing the live streaming uh, so like you mean this by how the platform is shaped that you have got like a nice attachment of the platform of your smartphone to your kind of point of view or what do you mean by this i think well also the, the way that the platform is shaped also shapes how we are physically present in these life experiences so um, similar way as that, I don't know, coronations or big events were shaped for the television cameras to capture this event in the best way. I, I noticed, for instance, in my research that people who are in uh, are present at these festivals, um, Facebook users, for instance, they walk through these events looking for some moments to then later on post as a collage. So their, their life experience in the moment is shaped by their gathering of experiences to post afterwards on Facebook. While people who use more of the live features such as Instagram stories or Snapchat are very much more um, in, in the moment videoing and that influences their experience in that moment. So the way that we are physically present in events is also shaped by in that sense by the platforms and how the platforms afford us to post or share or, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Feel free, uh, David or uh, Michael, if you want uh, 
to say something because I think uh, David also the, the what, what Esther just mentioned the being being present or like kind of the embodiment uh, during a live event is kind of a very interesting thing, which like uh, uh, points maybe also to the yeah to the fact like how is there also kind of embodiment taking place when I do a live streaming? So is yeah. there something kind of a embodying? embodiment think, myself into like the live stream just because I do the live stream in a certain moment at an event. Yeah, I'm also curious about that, David, because uh, um, that's what, what people have mentioned to me also in my research, that the feeling of being there is, it's, it, it has become part of the feeling of being there, very much the embodied feeling of being there. Yeah, I would have, I just have a question for the, for the understanding. Do you speak of when you speak of the live stream, you mean that being be doing also this live stream or people that watch the live stream? Um, I think embodiment is important in any way, but uh, in this case, I meant the people who are physically present at the event or or joining the event by creating live streams or live stories or live snaps. Yeah. This this is uh, I would say this is a good question because I I have no not this kind of in depth view that you have um by by, by being there but uh, there's a I would say that there's a certain interesting switch in the way how these events are lived or um, and 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 experienced and for example I, I was uh, what made what made me curious was your description of um, the kind of uh, they look for spots um, they could take for the Facebook timeline. Which is um, which, which brings me immediately to the idea um, of, of perception of time in, the, in these events uh, and how this kind of embodied how this coupling between the body and the media in this in this case the smartphone with the Instagram uh, platform how this media body coupling changes completely the perception of time in this in, in, in this event because it, it's a it's a real difference if you enter into a concert for example or a festival. And you just like look where are your friends and where's a where's a where's a group or where's a nice spot to uh, listen to some music for two or three songs, for example. Then you get your drink or I don't know, but it's a it's a different way of spacing your body in this in this in, in this environment. And then you have like this idea that you have your, um, your your tool with you that I would not say that controls how you move, but it's it's a part of a kind of antis anticipation. You have a kind of anticipatory attitude towards what will happen in this space, and that's the way how you completely how you how you uh, perceive different this this whole uh, space in this festival area than someone that is not coupled to this uh, um, to a to, to a mobile phone with an Instagram platform, for example. So this is just a simple. Um, on um, idea or observation, but I think that the concept of uh, um, consciousness of time, or <laughs> philosophical uh, subject, but it's a pretty uh, nice example to show how the consciousness of time changes here through uh, uh, body media couplings. Um, then I, I jump in as well for this. Um, I think there are two, two things that, that we can distinguish. One is that every medium has a specific way uh, allowing liveness to happen or not. And, and for example, I know that in a lot of these meetings that we had over the couple of the last um, uh, two years, um, we were meeting in Zoom uh, during the daytime. And then afterwards we were meeting in Gathertown uh, or some other, uh, environment that had a, a similar functionality that you could bring people together over video streams, but Gathertown has this playful component, there's a 2D world, you run around with a little avatar, and you can get in and out of these talks, whereas in Zoom, um, you are kind of like frontal office uh, feeling. So that, that's one thing. So every, every particular medium brings uh, its own particular use uh, with it. But then within the medium, you have also the, let's say the mainstream use and the avant-garde use, uh, so to call it. So for example, in Zoom, um, we are, or yeah, I, I, I take a step back. Uh, when, when Mark Zuckerberg announced the metaverse uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, 
Mark Zuckerberg showed pictures of offices and office space and 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 avatars like sitting sitting in an office space in VR, which everyone who has been doing stuff in VR found exactly as exciting as looking at a wall um, paint dry, um, as we say here. Um, because that's not what I, I don't want a recreation of, of, of an office of a uh, company office in, in the metaverse. And the same with Zoom. I mean, uh, Zoom has become a synonym uh, in, the, in the common uh, parlor for sitting like, like we do right now. We have this front, we, sit, we all sit, we all, uh, you see our faces, we have good, we have a background that came a bit later when people. Um, the backgrounds, I think, also it would be interesting to research a bit deeper. And probably some people did. Uh, wh why do we have these virtual backgrounds? Some people, um, they're kind of like you show your private space, right? Or you don't want to show your private space. And and but that is mainstream. Now comes the avant-garde. Um, during 2020, I was uh, part of um, some, or I met some people online who were burners. Um, burners are people who go to festivals like Burning Man. And Burning Man people had looked for uh, how can they transport this kind of experience into the virtual, of course, and they were experimenting with it. And so we had meet. And so first of all, the question of opening your room to to strangers is is a question of intimacy, right? So you show your your private space to others is a is a negotiation of intimacy. What do you want to show? How do you want to? Are you cleaning up your room before or just show it in all its uh, normal glory? And then we had these meetings where we would like lie on the bed and um, do things and not having the camera pointed to us, but just being there and knowing that other peoples are there as well. And like sharing moments of liveness with intimate, really intimate moment. And, and this for me was kind of like another experience that showed me like this is absolutely possible. Um, also the physical spaces were quite far apart. And um, as David said, a very interesting question is the matter of what does it mean, uh, like temporality? What what is same? What is the same time? Because there is always some sort of time difference uh, th that we know from, um, for example, when there's a football game, I always hear the neighbors um, shouting first because they have a, a different uh, way to watch a live stream in football than I have. And uh, so, what is what is the same? What is the same moment in in um, mediated right? Um, but for me, that makes it completely so. So for me, that's very interesting. Are these kind of more like fringy experimental ways to to play with the notion of being together, being live, being um, uh, yeah, in, in in a virtual sense, as as David pointed out as well. I think to to uh, continue on that uh, question about time. Uh, temporality. That's in my uh, thesis. I I decided to build on the on the Greek concept of kairos, uh, or kairos maybe in Germany you would say, um, uh, which is not clock time, but like the opportune time, right? So the right time, uh, and I think that is what liveness is, especially when we mediate, when we experience this in mediated environments, that it is not so much about exactly at the same moment but it is about the experience of being there at the right time when when you are also there and we feel together socially um and i agree i, I think this is a very interesting experiment and i see that also in the netherlands at the moment cultural um uh, cultural festivals or events are are experimenting especially the the smaller ones uh with new ways of of doing these hybrid events because in the beginning of COVID, I think a lot of people just did their physical, uh, replaced their physical events with Zoom meetings or putting then a few people on a stage and, and a camera on it, but that's not a very nice engaging live experience, right? Um, so I've seen very nice experience with, for instance, I, I attended a meeting of the HUM, the Dutch uh, platform for internet culture that uh, Martina and I spoke about before. Um, they introduced a hybrid event where there were physical uh, visitors 
and I was an online visitor, for instance, and I was uh, coupled with a buddy who, uh, with her phone, showed the physical environment to me. So uh, we were, were we were sort of a team in the event, which made it into a very a totally different experience. So I could also, through a live stream, for instance, see speakers speak, but I could ask her to ask questions in the room to that speaker, or she could show me art installations that are art installations that were there and we could discuss it together uh, as opposed to just watch it, watching it or following it um, and I agree that this this created also a sort of an intimate uh, space between me and my buddy because I didn't know her beforehand so but I just I was uh, because my family was busy around me I was sitting in my bed uh, with her on my video phone um, and we didn't know each other, right? So that is quite intimate, I think. And also uh, she was in this room when the speakers were speaking and I could just intrude into her physical environment by saying, could you please raise your hand and ask this question to the speaker, which is also quite intimate or direct. Uh, I think it has, to, has a lot to do with intimacy in that sense. You also just mentioned uh, the the body kind of uh, as also a crucial moment. And David, when you pre gave your five minutes pitch, you said that um, yeah, dur during a live event, there's always a coupling of the body and the media. And I want to ask like one more time, is it really the body or is it maybe just the upper body or just the face? Because if we talk like about Zoom meetings or we talk about yeah, the uh, Mark Zuckerberg metaverse proposals where you have the, got those avatars without feet, uh, you always kind of reduce the human body just like uh, to the face or to the upper body. It would be like funny if we just see uh, our feet or legs walking in the camera and we try to feel something about liveness. Uh, what would you say, uh, David? Is it still like a way of being embodied or is it kind of a certain, is it maybe not about the whole body or um, uh, is it maybe just the face or are there like, do we need to kind of being more precise when talking about embodiment? Because I think there's really something in this, uh, in this thing of being embodied, experiencing liveness in virtual spaces like in Zoom or other platforms. Yeah, thank you. Um... I, I would say, yes, we have to be precise if you want to describe this, uh, this phenomena. This sounds like a classic academic phrase, but <laughs> the way it's, the way it's okay, you, you, you know how it goes. Okay, people describe their experiences and experiences, and at the end we ask ourselves, so what's, so what's, so what's the, um, the, the point here? That's why I would say, of course, we have to uh, describe them. And also, um, that's the challenge that I've mentioned earlier, um, find uh, the right methods and uh, the right concepts to, to describe it. I think it's, it's, it's important important for artists and, 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 and scholar, academic scholars as well, right? Because it's also, you have also to be aware to not take all these concepts from the big advertisement world around these technologies, which also coexist, which uh, uh, Michael uh, rightly pointed out with this metaverse example. And here's also, uh, uh, also uh, my argument with this with the same background, where I would say, of course, we should talk about the body and the whole body being affected. That's why I would stick to embodiment. And I would not start to um, reduce it to facial um, um, sensations to sen and to reduce it to certain sensations um, at all. Although one can make research about these sensations, but I would still say that even though you are sitting in Zoom meetings or other meetings, whatever, um, three hours, it's a completely embodied situation. It starts with the way how you sit, if you feel comfortable. It, st it starts how your body gives responses about the way he becomes fatigued. Uh, it's, it's also the question what you do with your hands, if they are sweaty, if you put them on the table and things like that. So this is this uh, uh, body media coupling is not a metaphor. It's something that is practiced all the time. So really it's an, in the philosophy with, um, right now, they use um, often this concept of inaction. So being engaged with your world. And this world has to not, not, has not to be physical. The inactive position is a position that is also going on in a, in a, in a virtual um, uh, with a virtual or digital environment to put it like this this time, right? 
Um, and the other reason why I would stick to this being um, affected um, or to a, to a pretty general, not general, but to a, to a, to a large space of, of embodied phenomena, let's put it like this. Huh? Um, the other reason is that we've witnessed in the 1990s and in the 2000s with digital technologies, um, also in media studies, I would say, and in philosophy, that you had always the talks of what kind of sensual perception is realized technologically. Yeah? Is it is it the optical? Is it a, is it a visual one? Is it better with these screens? Is it the tactile one? Do we have the data glove? Is this data glove good enough? And all the time, uh, also in, the, in 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 theories, that they were was talking like, yeah, it becomes more natural because because you can touch it and things like that. And automatically, you've been in this kind of technological and automatically a technological discourse where, oh wait, ten in ten years these technologies will be better. Then we have a tactile sensation of this virtual space, and this has led more or less to not much uh, theoretical innovation. I would say. Um, yeah. That's that's why I would also stick to this concept of uh, virtuality because you have the whole space how people be have been affected with these uh, uh, body media couplings huh? and not just to say oh wait in the 1990s there was this uh, virtual reality just uh, Jerry Lanier and then we had this and then we had this you can you can get rid of this uh, uh, narration. Um, I, I, I want to say absolutely the point of um, uh, uh, the, the one, one direction is the technological one, but also this idea that, oh, we, we have to be immersed more if, if we have more pixels and so stuff. In game studies, uh, they, they, they talk about the immersive fallacy. That means uh, it's a fallacy to believe that if, if there are more pixels and if there are more uh, things that uh, then 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 the liveness moment comes and and it come uh, it can come uh, totally in different in different ways and, and much more low tech and I'm I'm gonna try to show you I'm gonna I'm gonna make a little experiment here um, and I have to push out my background um, for a sec um, trying to show you something and so uh, this is me. Um, in a uh, robotic conference in um, Korea, um, I think that was one or two years ago, and I'm here in a telepresence uh, robot, and uh, so they they uh, enabled us to you 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 could book some time slots, uh, which were unfortunately at four a.m. in the morning in the in the UK where I lived at that time, and I was in at four in the morning in the UK, but I was at the same time in a conference in. Um, in Korea about about ro robotics and a friend of mine who was also at the conference, which I, I didn't know first, she took that took that photo, and and the thing about um, embodiment in in this case is that I um, so it was it was wonderful strange moment, but also I expected that I could um, I, I would be enabled to uh, drive around uh, with the with the telepresence robot, um, and I couldn't. Uh, because they had limited the thing, they, that thing stood there, and the only thing I could do was so. To, so there was an interface, and I could I could uh, take the the screen up and down, and that was what I was doing all the time. That was going up and down and up and down. So I was trying to signal to these people, and uh, just to show you again uh, briefly, the people were not really taking notice. I, I was thinking like everyone would stop by and and wave and stuff like that, but most of the people didn't even take notice. Maybe it's total normal there. Uh, anyway, but in, in, this, in that feeling of embodiment that I had in the telepresence uh, thing was that I could, I was very restricted in my actions. So up, down, up, down. Um, and, and this was an interesting, this was an interesting reminder of the uh, kind of McLuhan uh, media thing. Um, that, they, that we are restricted in a sense, uh, but also we can try to be playful and we can try to experiment with it. And um, uh, yeah, so so what David said, um, absolutely embodiment all the time, also time, place and, and, and the social aspect as well, because the social interactions was there. I was, I was watching a conference, I was watching talks and in the, in the breaks, I was expecting people to, to stop by and there were very few people who were really talking to me. But um, yeah, that, um, 
just uh, share that example as a as an embodied life uh, experience. And to add on that, also to pick upon uh, pick on uh, the uh, work of McLuhan, I think um, it is one thing that we enter other spaces through media, as you did at this conference, which influences how you experience it. But also the way we experience our physical surroundings is is thoroughly formed by um, by the media that we use. So, for instance, um, in my thesis, you could find uh, a lot of images. People tend to make images of themselves in these physical spaces, which include their backgrounds there or their, their festival grounds with, for instance, their hands holding a glass or their feet in the in the image. Right. So. In that sense, I think the, their experience, their embodied experience of being in the physical space is uh, performed through the images they share on Instagram. And thus, I think that that influences their, their feeling of truly being there and also their, their senses, sensory feeling of truly being there. Um, as I also noticed, for instance, that people told me they, they emphasize I, I really saw it with my own eyes or it was amazing to, to, to really stand on that boat in that canal parade. Why? Because they saw it before through media. So not only the media that we use in the moment, but also our media experiences beforehand thoroughly shape um, how we experience. I mean, and this was before COVID, uh, this wouldn't go for, for conferences or for your workplace or whatever. But now I think this, this is more and more happening in the sense that I, I saw my colleagues today real with my own eyes, which we didn't see, uh, see each other for a long time in that way. So it, I think it also poses the question, it changes how our embodied experiences. And I, I think it, it's an interesting thought, Ilya, the focus on the visual and maybe a part of the body, but I think um, that we experience, uh, for instance, Zoom meetings and mediated experiences with certain parts of our senses and bodies changes how we physically experience it, because then maybe we feel more fully that our feet are standing on this surface, or we feel the wind in our face, or we feel the physical warmth of people around us. Um, and it poses questions about where are we, where then does the event take place? So um, where were you when you were in that conference? Were you in some, in, in the internet? Were you in your home in the UK? Were you in Korea? You were saying, I think the conference took place. So wh where, where is the life experience situated? Yeah, it gets confusing, right? Um, <laughs> when, you, when you try to pinpoint it to a, to a certain uh, uh, location, that is so distributed over 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 the channels, and I, I, um, I also want to um, just to to hang on to Ilya's uh, remark about the media because I think we, we are in a in a in a very ver uh, visual oriented like or or visual first sort of sort of mediation. That, that's always the first concern. Like, how does it look? How many pixels do we have? But uh, for my own practice, and uh, I, I realize that sound becomes more and more. Uh, important and especially for virtual spaces for virtual reality for 360 uh, immersion this kind of stuff sound is for me now the premier medium and then secondly um, um, comes the visual uh, but but uh, um, so last um, just on, on Saturday I took a workshop which was a, a really interest, interesting experience which was a workshop for um, uh, yeah subsonic sound uh, which was um, uh, made in uh, cooperation with people uh, like hearing impaired people so we had a, 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 a translator there and there were people who were hearing impaired and there were people and um, we had um, they had constructed these seats where, where we could send low frequency oscillations to our backs and um, this gave you a totally different experience of the room and of, of these things and uh, subwoofers vibrations sound sound is vibration I mean we are on the Kind of, we have on the one hand we have the electromagnetic spectrum, and then we have the, um, the, the the material wave spectrum. They're all waves and and oscillations and stuff. But it's so interesting to think about how can we create live events. And um, I I I, I um, concede to David that it that it's not like the hope that oh do we have smell smell internet or 
you know, uh, virtual touch, virtual haptics. It's an interesting field. I was really, I, when I saw the first like virtual haptics thing where you have like this ultrasonic stuff that makes you feel sensations on your skin that are a bit feeling like if you, if you hold something, that is amazing stuff. I mean, it's mind blowing stuff, but I don't think that we are contingent on that on that progress on that and, and again bring that back to this technological fantasy that if it's only more and better and uh, uh, more resolution then we can feel it we can feel it quite downstream we can feel it in a in a uh, yeah I, I would say um that, uh, pretty dumb tele telepresence robot that cannot even drive around but just go up and down we can feel stuff um there yeah, and I think also that it's also the idea that it could be better um, negates what there is, the life experience that is there. And I think, I mean, I've spoken to the, the one of the events that I, I studied is uh, highly televised and a lot of people watch it on telev television, live television and do not go to the physical space. Uh, but I mean, I spoke to people who were both physically there and followed it on TV and say it was just a very different experience. And people very much uh, emphasize their physical environments when they watch television, their own living rooms there. It's always the week before Christmas. So their Christmas decorations, the dog that is there, the very soft blanket they have on their couch, which is very important in their experience of the event. So that I, I think it's not so much about uh, negating or making the medium invisible or being able to smell how it is at that event but it's also including the physical space in which we experience these events also when we follow them at a distance for me it's like now um this was one idea you said that um with the with the digital liveness or the digital events or the mediated uh, uh, situations that the physical liveness i think esther spoke about it like being on the boat becomes more concrete more important more and then i thought yeah perhaps uh, now we speak about liveness <laughs> when there was no pandemic time we went to theater to festivals the festival was great or whatever and the performance was nice and it was so normal, it was so for granted. Um, so um, perhaps we never knew what, what liveness is in a way. You know what I mean? Now we start uh, to think about it. Um, yeah, it was just there, it was no, no question. It was just life presence. And yes, then we have from theater studies, for example, some things like uh, from, from performativity studies from Erika Fischer-Lichte, it's, uh, it's liminality, the corporality, perception is opened and heightened and so on. But um, I, think, I think now it becomes much more clearer, much more complex uh, than, than if, if, if we have more possibilities, more options. This I found very interesting. And the example Esther told from, from being um, normally you have the, normally you are. Uh, um, it, the, it's the example you gave from uh, you are in virtual space and there's somebody in a life or in a physical space and you ask the, the person, please ask this question. This is like an inversion. Normally it's um, it is the avatar who must do something, walk, I'm, I'm, I'm guiding or I'm tapping on my keys, keyboard and then the avatar is walking or not walking depending how stupid I am. <laughs> but then this is, I found this very, very interesting to, to make this inversion from, from, from the virtual to the physical. And to that's you from the from the virtual guiding the, uh, guiding the people in, in the physical, which is um, then it's becoming creepy, mysterious. Who is it? And um, yeah, this is um, then it's like a ghosty aspect also of 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 liveness in a way. That who knows what is between the earth and the sky <laughs> to speak with um, uh, from. <laughs> with this uh, older ideas. Um, and yeah, I think this also idea. the intimacy that uh, Michael noted. I think that this intimacy is something that is very important. Mm, yeah, I would agree. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I do, 
just just a short remark because I, I've noticed also when when you when you brought up this term in, in intimacy, um, because it's um, well one of these one of these maybe very at least for, from my point of view and I think you you two uh, or, or we all here have already a, a bit touched upon this uh, is, is is really this idea of um, the way we are affected by actions that are done not in this not in the same space or done by these uh, uh, um, 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 body media couplings which are not the classical causal relationships in interactions yeah? like typing in and then the avatar moves or things like that yeah so we have like real um, um, for example with the, with what, what, what Esther uh, mentioned that we have a kind of uh, a real uh, a, an action that in which we become a part of so so this is also this, that might sound pretty trivial, but on the other hand, this 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 presupposes also to open up your own space, so the way to let your control go a bit. Right? Michael mentioned also this this uh, this idea of having this this kind of um, feeling of control. So, the, but the point I would like to make is also with this with this idea: how, what space do you open to a virtual space right, with your camera and the things and things like that? It's all this question: of how you deal with your own space, with your own embodied space of intimacy, and at what point are you are you uh, ready? Are you are you prepared to open this uh, this uh, this space? And I think these 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 questions. I think that, that these are uh, these are uh, daily questions that that people that are engaged in these uh, body media couplings are are answering all the time, but they do not make it explicit. It's a way just okay. I'm the user. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. But all the time you kind of negotiate. You, you negotiate your own uh, space of. Uh, uh, intimacy and uh, the space, how you want to be affected uh, uh, bodily. And I do not speak of in the sense of being su uh, being surveilled and things like that. I'm not interested in, 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 this, at, in, in this at all. Yeah. For example, to make it uh, a bit more clear, there's a, a, I think a very nice word from the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, who called this a passivitätskompetenz. So the competence of being passive. And I think that, that uh, this, this coins it very well because it's a, this, this idea to, to get away from this idea from this active user who is always typing in and then expecting that something pops out at the end of the technological chain of, of channel and that's the output, voila. And it's not that anymore. So it's, it's, it's also the question, uh, uh, what, kind of, um, um, what kind of intimacy is uh, negotiated and how, what kind of new competence do we gain by these uh, uh, new uh, media body couplings? That was, that was my brief uh, 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 intervention concerning the intimacy. Yeah, and I, I think for 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 what we, what we just said and and what what has been said before, uh, what Martina mentioned also, it is useful to look into the game studies actually because in in uh, in in online multiplayer games, um, there there has been a long tradition of people uh, being uh, at least temporarily present in form of their avatars. Uh, and Rooney Clavier, uh, for example, has written about avatars, the, the, the coupling of uh, the gamer body, which is, which is usually a, a limited kind of input, um, as you said, David, um, where I press a few buttons or I, I use a mouse, but it's also very crucial to the interaction in that virtual space, like how, how, how competent I am and, and how I get into these things. And again, also to the question of activity and passivity, uh, there have been long, uh, long ago um, experiments with so-called not games, uh, uh, game, game-like environments where you don't, where you not act like a typical active uh, gamer, but uh, um, so-called walking simulators or stuff where you just walk through, through a landscape and there's nothing happening. You just experience it in a, in a, in a sense, and. Um, so the game studies can give us some hints to that to that thing, and I have the feeling that the that the, the theater studies are still catching up in that in in that field. Uh, but of course, the theater studies have a, a much longer also idea of um, being like the the physical aspect of of like being on stage and and being on. Um, uh, and that brings me back to what uh, one of the aspects Esther mentioned, and, and we haven't really talked about, uh, 
is the social aspect. And the social aspect for me includes like what is the, um, in, in, a, in a performative setting, for example, what is the relationship between the performers and the so-called audience? Like, am I, am I a passive uh, um, watcher of a, of a theater play in a live situation? Um, I, I remember I have read uh, in, in a German uh, theater magazine not long time ago, there was a, a, a plea uh, for going back into the theater because the person wanted to be uh, constrained to their seats for two hours and they were longing for that experience because if you watch the stream at home they said you can get up you can go to your uh, refrigerator you can um, lie on the sofa and this is not real German uh, theater um, German theater you have to be bound to your seat and you cannot talk and you have to look forward um, and I found it quite ridiculous, uh, to be honest, because it, it has some sort of masochistic quality, right? To, uh, I was thinking about bondage and stuff. Um, I'm not going into that too much, but like this sort of restriction. I mean, the, we can ask ourselves, does it have a quality in itself in a, in a life situation to be restricted? Uh, but if you go to a festival, for example, the, the stuff of festivals that uh, Easter um, has researched we want to be free we want to do stuff uh, we want to move around we, we don't want to have somebody tell us like how to how to behave right um, so it, it, the social aspect is for me the question of like who like what is the relationship between the people who are in the life situation how is the power hierarchy and what are the rules in, in that situation and I think that that are interesting questions as well that's interesting. What I, I like the the link you you put there between like feeling restricted and feeling free, and in which situations do we feel free or restricted? Because in some sense, I think following an event through media restricts us. Right? We, I'm now sitting in my chair, and it would be weird if I would go walk to the fridge to grab a drink. Um, while in other situations, uh, at a festival, we could walk there together or at a conference, if this would be a physical meeting, we could just decide to get a drink together, right? So there's more freedom in that sense when you're physically together, uh, but in some settings there isn't. So in the theater set setting there isn't, and also, uh, I mean, I also teach in education, there isn't. And I think uh, what, what I see in education and in teaching, um, and I think we also see in, in theater, is that we we I think we we will need to find new competences how to how to deal with this when I am joining a class online or when I'm joining joining a theater piece online what will be the new rules or the way to go about this how will I um, focus how will I remain concentrated on what is going on uh, what I'm watching or or will the theater change and incorporate the, this aspect of me being in my own home. Um, the event that I mentioned before where, where I was um, guided by a buddy, they also, during the break, they had a very nice uh, intervention. They said, well, you could go to the bar, you can ask your buddy to carry you to the bar, and then you can show the contents of your fridge to the bar bartender, and that person will tell you what drink you could make from your contents of your fridge. I mean, speaking of intimacy, I don't know what your fridge looks like, but mine is a mess mostly. Uh, so that, I thought that was a very nice, nice way of, of incorporating or, or playing or experimenting with these spaces and where we are. When, when it comes to restrictions, um, I always have to think about VR because uh, being like in a virtual environment, it's kind of being restricted, being limited uh, from all those possibilities uh, which you have around in your I quote, uh, David, how did you call the, the real world? The, uh, I have so many notes. The, the live world, no. You said something. There was an, an, a phrase for the real world. I really yeah, appreciate. the live world. The live world, right? Yeah. So being in VR is kind of being restricted from the live world. And um, although actually VR has got many, many other possibilities, I think it's, it's always about how do you use VR? Is it like just a just a game is it a collaboration tool or is it like a way of asking about borders boundaries limits of the real world and actually i mean 
uh, in VR, you can like go through every wall. You can be Harry Potter and run uh, into the next world and next world. So there are like no limits actually. Um, and I want uh, like to, to make the, 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 the bridge between the limitation aspect and the live streaming aspect. I mentioned earlier that nowadays in TikTok, Instagram, everywhere you have got like this one button press live streams and you also have it on Oculus Quest. You have kind of an uh, uh, one press live stream if you are in your metaverse or on your Oculus Quest platform. And there I wonder, okay, what kind of concept of embodiment is working there if you connect like a virtual embodiment in an immersive environment and a moment of live streaming. So you stream kind of live from a world which doesn't exist uh, in this live world uh, sense and still something should be in it or is it just a marketing gag? Uh, what do you think about it? <laughs> I could respond a bit in that sense that I see it happen more often and more. I mean, in gaming, as Michael referred to, I think we can learn a lot about gaming uh, from the gaming world. You see that also in Twitch, for instance, right? That people, they're playing games and they live stream their gaming, their live events organized around virtual gaming surroundings or environments. Um, and for instance, I forgot the name of the platform, but my, my colleague recently told me about his, uh, he, he does um, um, a biking. And there's this platform, I think maybe Swift or something like that, where you, you bike actually, you, you connect your bike to this platform and you are in your living room but truly biking and then you do these virtual races so you could drive through rome or or paris or whatever cologne um uh, and also do do games like matches against others so you'll ride a, a circuit in rome but with competitors from the netherlands or china or the us or whatever and that is also then again live stream so uh, also, the, the virtual environment as I, as well, I could put like a, a camera webcam on myself in my living room streaming how I am virtually racing, which incorporates so many levels of spaces and environments and and is embodied. I mean, people are actually biking and sweating. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I would um, remark that I don't draw the distinction between virtual and real. I, I think it's a problematic one. Uh, one is the reason that David mentioned about, uh, because the notion of virtual is, is a different one. Uh, I think uh, for me, for me, an email, for example, an email is, is a sort of virtualized communication, but the, the, the content of the email is real for me. I mean, the, um, uh, the results are real. The, uh, the, uh, what it says is real. I act real so even if it comes to a digital medium it's totally real so i don't i don't think the distinction a virtual real makes sense so I, I always talk about the distinction uh between virtual and physical but um again um that is also not a distinction saying one or the other because like david said these are coupled in a sense so we, we uh, uh or feldenkrais said everything and, and this for me was an interesting thought kind of like a, a enlightenment <laughs> moment and um, a small enlightenment moment everything we experience is through the body so uh, even even the most banal things like if we read uh, uh, i don't know our bank statements or, or whatever it's it's through our bodies and and so the body is so important and, and body work and all this stuff is so important so there's not really the distinction doesn't really mean it's it's one or the other because when you are in vr and for me, it's always like I have an older VR headset. I always feel the cable. I always feel that the drag of the physical, and in in that sense. And when I go outside of the of the tracked space, uh, there's something happening. Um, but for me, being in a in a in a virtual environment is as real in my reality in that moment as if I'm in a physical environment. It is real. It is actually real. It's not. It's not potential. It's not what could be. But I'm there in that moment. And when I when I take the glasses off, I'm back in that in that in that other space. So this this notion of the of the kind of like other space, uh, I find I find interesting. 
maybe I would just um, add to this, and I basically agree with the, the thing I would add to 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 to, to what Ilya um, um, asked. And I'm really not familiar with these new, new metaverse applications. And this sounds really interesting to me, but I, I have the slightly feeling that, that I have to catch something up. Um, however, uh, this, uh, and I, do, I don't have any kind of explanation. It's just this, this, that came to my mind, maybe from the game of theater studies, you have something um, idea or, or something on this that would, would interest me a lot is that um, what I was asking myself that, in this in this idea of this virtuality with this as if words right? and the and the plur, plurality of words that I've mentioned, with, for example, uh, fictions and and maybe also artworks, exhibitions, and things like that. So what we a kind of what we witness now, which is obvious, but on the other hand, not so easy to explain, is this kind of um, purification of these um, um, of these words through machines. Right, so we have this kind of these, these machines enable a certain a purification. Of course, this there are this is programmed and things like that. But um, this there's a certain um, um, I don't know what to, I don't want to say access, but the kind of an access with an A and double C um, to this plur, uh, plurality um, um, of these words, and um, this 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 also constitutes new 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 constellations. The way. Um, um, the way how we observe each other, right? which which is a, a, maybe a new phenomenon of the social in this in in, in these metaverse examples that you've mentioned. But I really do not know how to um, 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 how to touch uh, upon this. It's more it's more a new kind of new challenge. So that's why I would be into, uh, very curious if um, there are ideas from from from, from other disciplines on this. Uh, I'm still in uh, in David's input about virtual reality and the historical view you you gave from Aristote to Renaissance uh, that uh, it was more it was the potential linked to the physical and then uh, it became the the potential but linked to speculation and imagination to uh, beyond uh, and now Michael said that for for him we are is always very physical in, in the sense he is in the sense of the embodiment. Um, and um, I remember when I was uh, younger, from nine or ten years old, my mother forced me to go to theater with her. She had an abu, abonnement, <laughs> and we went uh, all, th all two weeks, and I fell in love with every <laughs> actor on stage. <laughs> Made be and it was a variety of program opera operette uh, uh, actors play and so and um, I always thought he sees only me he's looking to me <laughs> and uh, and and he sees me and he's looking that I'm looking to him and for me this was uh, this helped me to <laughs> afterwards I studied theater studies who knows but uh, in this when I was younger this was to help me to survive these theater evenings. <laughs> This 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 laugh um, and this uh, so my my question is this was a live event I, I wasn't in VR but uh, and then there was a VR performance by Cyberräuber in Berlin and then I was so so shocked the the actor it was an opera piece they did with the theater I don't know what and then suddenly the the opera singer he came very near to me in this virtual space and uh, I thought oh God, oh Lord now he's there. <laughs> this real actor and it was uh, it, it was too near yeah so so the stage was great because it was uh, far away but suddenly this virtual actor came to me. so this um yeah so I try, what i try to understand is the relation between the potential we are as a potential um um and and liveness because uh, yeah, this was 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 one of the thoughts we had in the beginning to discuss digital liveness uh, that that the virtual becomes the re real as as real as as other worlds. Um, but if we have this notion of potential potentiality, does could it help us to understand digital liveness and even physical liveness? This falling in love with every actor on stage. Um, I try to think these two points together. I think that I, I, I feel that they are together, but I, I cannot 
name it in a way. And um, and then this notion of um, is there a digital liveness? If we rethink the notion of liveness, um, um, if we are in techno human cooperation, the bounding between humans and machines, we, we talked about this. Um, uh, uh, like these are two aspects. Um, yeah, but but for, for me, how, how can we think together this what we are as potential, even if it's very real in the embodiment, but um, um, we, 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 somebody through the walls and we can do so much, so much, so many things. Uh, so all this imaginary, imaginary and all this speculation and, and liveness. Uh, I don't know. It's not a clear question, but how to think together the, the potential, the potentiality of as as notion as as a, a, a definition for virtuality and and um, and liveness. I, yeah, I I could add. I think that seeing that we are in these hybrid environments, that that these mediated environments are included or mixed with our physical environments, I think it it makes us see also the physical as possible spaces, right? As and, and liveness as performative, even when it's in a physical environment. Uh, so I think in that sense, it's, it's intermingling more and more. And um, yeah, it helps us to see the possibilities of being in the physical world, maybe, maybe more also. I see Michael, Michael uh, yeah. wanting to say something. <clears throat> no, I definitely, I definitely agree. I think these are, um, the, the German word uh, um, the, these are areas that uh, uh, can learn from each other and, and, and can uh, come up with, with stuff like what Martina described with her, um, with her youth flattery is, is, is a, it's, a, it's an old stage trick, right? It's, it's, a, it's a technique of actors to make the uh, audience think that they are exactly looking at one person, right? And and but this this can be this can be practiced and then that where I'm coming back to the to the uh, practice of game design and, and uh, where or or we are uh, design UI UX uh, stuff where you where you um, practice these these techniques um, and I also think about this intermingling uh, that Issa that you just said I, I just phrase it a bit differently I I I I won't answer to Martina don't look for definitions forget them. Uh, they don't make sense. Um, uh, look for distinctions. So, look for look for uh, things that what what is x as opposed to y, and then go from there. Uh, it's it's much more, it's a, it's a much better approach. Um, so so we don't need to define something, right? Uh, we just can can move through that space of intermingling things and and observe what, what is what is happening there. Um, that will be my answer. Yeah, and I think also returning to the aspect of, of sociality or the social space that you are in, social context that you are in, this intermingling, um, it creates these questions of, of intimacy or also who is included in, in your experience. I mean, when you're in a theater in the audience, the audience is quite clear, right? You, you're sitting there together uh, and the distance is also clear between the people on stage and the people in the audience. And I think this is, this is changing as... Um, we bring in other audiences or people or our social bonds into the experiences that we are in. Um, in these events, I noticed that people bring in their mothers through with whom they communicate through, via WhatsApp or, or whatever when they're there, or uh, they, they deliberately pause some communications with others to focus on being in the social space of the crowd on the ground but also sometimes include others. Uh, for instance, in Pride, I noticed this very much, that people through hashtags connect to a worldwide community through which they, they, they experience even more that they're there for a cause or in certain social environment. So I think also the, the notion of audiences and publics and, and social contexts in which we experience, have our life experiences are very much influenced in that sense by, um, yeah, by, by the media we use and by this intermingling. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Maybe just um, one, one thing um, to the experience of Martina. 
um, uh, big concept, but uh, what always comes also with uh, new with new media are new ways of experiencing uh, contingency. So you kind of you never know how you will make your experience. And there's also this question of control and feeling of control or this the certain space where you have to let loose your control to be um, 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 affected. I just mentioned this because uh, because you've mentioned the the, the, the idea of, uh, of this potentiality and uh, uh, somehow the one who makes kind of historical claims has also explained them a bit. So that's why I just just, just come back to this example with uh, 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 going away from this uh, Aristotelian idea of virtuality and being able as and this is also also I would say as 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 a technology technological being as humans are uh, to create this world of possibilities. You always have to face the fact that you um, will encounter a new a new contingency because you do not know what will expect you and this is the kind of uh, um, a very very old i would say but uh, uh, always reappearing experience of humans with their own technologies that they would like to um, hide between their mastering and their, their technical functionalities but this is something we always have to stay um, open to uh, not always in the in a in a in a bad sense in the way of kind of how to look that we can avoid uh, uh, bad consequences or or psychic illnesses through media use or media body couplings and things like that we just witness the fact that we as living and also dying entities um, um the, the way how we experience these couplings uh, depends also on the fact that we are uh, um, um, entities that end at a certain point and that are faced with contingency yeah? and that's what living is always about whether more or less uh, uh, technological and this was also one of these big questions um, in this 15th and uh, 16th centuries which from the virtuality that uh, was cut off from the nature and also from God who created nature so if you have no authority who is responsible for all this creation and the things you will face in your life then you're and it's up to your own to face contingency and to be responsible for this in a certain way yeah. or to deal about the way how you are responsible <laughs> for this which is also a social question yeah. but the thing i would like to uh, would like to point to it's also we should not forget in all these ideas about digital liveness that's still the, the, the fact that we face new contingencies and that all these we, we should also be kind of open for these contingencies yeah? that's because there's also a way how to how to learn um, to live with this these, these new um, 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 technical environments. <laughs>